Welcome to the Exploring Unschooling podcast. I'm Pam Larickia, longtime unschooling mom and author. Join me and my wonderful guests for interviews, information, and inspiration about unschooling and living joyfully with your family. You can find the episode show notes, your free introductory ebook, What is Unschooling?, and lots more information at livingjoyfully.ca. And here's the show. Hello, everyone. I'm Pam Larickia, and this is episode number 77 of the podcast. It's the 21st of June, 2017, as I record this intro, and it's the official first day of summer. Yay! Now, in this episode, I have a very fun chat with Joe Watt. Joe is an ex-teacher and now stay-at-home mom of two girls, ages four, five anytime now, and six. She blogs at girlsunschool.co.uk, and about six months ago, she, her husband Chris, and the girls moved from the UK to the US Pacific Northwest. We have a great time digging into learning to read, when people want to do different things, what fair means, the value of free time, when we find ourselves out of step with our kids, and so much more goodness. As a personal update this week, I've been enjoying the less rainy weather and doing some work outside. So more reorganization of the brush piles, trimming low-hanging branches, pulling weeds, cleaning paths, that kind of stuff. I really enjoy the repetitive nature of the work. It's really peaceful. And sometimes I listen to podcasts. Other times I just quietly sink into it, not really thinking about much at all. And I've also been writing a lot lately on the Unschooling Journey book, and it's finding its shape, so that quiet time helps with the subconscious mulling as well. I really love my work. And I want to say thank you to everyone who has chosen to support the show on Patreon. And a big welcome to new patrons Bridget Cole, Dana Arliss, and Bridget Berg. I deeply appreciate all my patrons. You guys inspire me. And I love that you're helping me share unschooling information with anyone who wants to explore ways to live this wonderful lifestyle with their family. And if you'd like to support the show, even for as little as a dollar a month, check out the Exploring Unschooling page at patreon.com. That's p-a-t-r-e-o-n.com forward slash exploring unschooling. And this week's quote is from Joe. It seemed weird choosing home ed at all, and unschooling just didn't seem like it was enough, which, of course, is crazy because it's everything, isn't it? It's opening your whole learning to everything and anything. That's the unschooling journey in a nutshell, isn't it? I love it. From this weird thing to everything, from the small window of compulsory school to life. The discovery that we are always learning, always changing and growing at every age never ceases to astound me with its beauty. It reminds me to dig in with all my heart and soul and that it's okay to get messy. Messy is beautiful. And that reminds me of a quote I share in my book, What is Unschooling? It's from Jean Anouy, and he wrote, To say yes, you have to sweat and roll up your sleeves and plunge both hands into life up to the elbows. It's easy to say no, even if it means dying. It's easy to say no because it's so scary to say yes, to open ourselves up, to plunge both hands into life up to the elbows. And that's probably why I need the reminder sometimes. So thanks very much, Joe, for setting me off on that trail. And now... On to the interview. Hi, everyone. I'm Pam Larickia from livingjoyfully.ca, and today I'm here with Joe Watt. Hi, Joe. Hello. Good morning. (laughs) Joe blogs at girlsunschooled.co.uk, and I have really enjoyed reading her thoughts about unschooling and parenting. And I also learned on the blog that about six months ago, her family moved from the UK to the Pacific Northwest of the United States. I'm super excited to chat with her today. And to get us started, Joe, can you share with us a bit about how you and your family came to unschooling? I can. Hi. Um, So, uh, Joe, I have a lovely husband, Chris, and two lovely daughters, um, Evie's six, and Clara, who's five in about three weeks which is crazy um so we 
we didn't plan to run school. We didn't even know what it was. Um, I had quite a specific idea of what kind of parent I'd be. I was going to be loving. I was going to have rules that I'd stick to. And I'd definitely have timeouts and reward charts. I don't know why. It's not something I respond well to. It's not the way I am generally. Um, I'm very inconsistent, although I like to say I'm flexible because it makes me sound a bit better. Um, but, and I really hate being told off. Always, I used to run away when I was little because I just hated it. I go and hide under the table somewhere. Um, and I was a teacher before I had the girls, and I wasn't strict at all. And there were school expectations of of rewards and punishments, and and I changed my mind about them all the time because they felt so unfair to the kids that I had in front of me. Um, so when I had the girls or Evie to start with, and poor Evie always gets that, um, the older child lack of any parenting skills um, thing. But I didn't know about attachment parenting, but that's really what we did. Um, I still thought that at some point I'd have to change, especially, you know, when there were toddlers and preschool, that I couldn't just carry on just being nice and looking after her needs and listening to her. And I did change. I started to have expectations that just weren't, realistic I thought she should be doing be able to listen to things and be able to react to things in a way that was far in excess of her you know 18 months of age um and so I tried to correct her and guide her I thought actually I was just being pushy I think um we went to quite a lot of toddler groups and it was clear really from early on that she wasn't interested in doing what everybody else was. She she wouldn't look and think, oh, yeah, all the kids are doing story time. I want to do that, too. She always wanted to be doing something else um, and not at all interested in conforming. Um, at that point, I didn't really feel because there's 18 months between them that I had any time to read about parenting ideals or any any other way but I, I knew that I had to look for something else because I felt like we were sort of struggling a little bit I had these two teeny children and I felt like it was just going from one challenge to the next um so I wasn't looking for unschooling because I'd never heard of it but I was looking for other things that might suit the children that we had like something to maybe manage behavior which seems awful now um, or other routes of education that might suit us um, we did start at that time as well changing our parenting because of the way that Evie particularly was reacting Clara was still a baby um, so we used fewer no's and we sought connection rather than punishment we tried not to restrict or coerce but we didn't use those words because we just didn't have them in our vocabulary really for that for that kind of thing um I think it was a kind of pick your battles and try to emphasize philosophy but it was definitely moving away from pushing and making them do what we wanted them to um we talked about home education and we knew that it would be good for us and I read some and I read a bit more and I joined all the groups um and then found unschooling and definitely thought that it, we couldn't do it it seemed it seemed weird choosing home ed at all and unschooling just didn't seem like it was enough, um, which of course is crazy because it's everything, isn't it? It's, mm -hmm. it's opening your whole learning to everything and anything. Um, and as we found it and as I de-schooled, which is, which is ongoing, um, it seemed like the best thing for us and that's what we've been working on ever since. Wow, that's awesome. And I... It, it seems like such a, a familiar story. Like, you know, at the beginning, you were talking about um, how, you know, you had this idea in your head of the parent you were going to be. Isn't that interesting how, you know, it might not even be quite similar to how we were raised, but it's kind of that perfect parent that we yeah. we've imagined right yeah yeah <laughs> it's, it's shown to be that you're really consistent and you have these rules and your children are perfect and if they're not then you just need to be more consistent and and actually then you have the children and they don't follow this path that you're expecting them to and they don't just fit into the boxes that you that you have and um and I'm glad because it makes you look for something else or it certainly did for us yeah and, and us too like with my eldest because you know you're you you have this image in your mind and then they come and mm -hmm. and you see them I think those of us you yeah. know that talk about how we were we ended up 
parenting in an attachment parenting way, although we hadn't yet heard the term, right? I, mm-hmm. I don't think I came across the term until I was starting to look in homeschooling and unschooling circles. Yeah. But Same. yeah, if, if it's, it's that point where you decide either, you know, I'm going to, uh, damn the torpedoes and I'm going to live up to that ideal parent, you know, or Mm -hmm. I'm going, I see my child and, and they're beautiful and they make sense. Their needs seem to make sense, yet their needs are in contrast with what I think I should be doing, you know, Mm -hmm. and and it's that, that budding where you kind of choose which way am I going to go, right? Yeah, yeah. And everybody's telling you, you're you know, going to make a rod for your own back and don't pick them up all the time. And yeah. all these things that seem so contrary to what your body and your mind and your baby are telling you to do. And, yes. and it doesn't stop at babyhood. It, it sort of carries on, doesn't it, throughout their childhood. Oh, it definitely keeps going. <laughs> That's awesome. I love that. Um, mm-hmm. I also love hearing what unschooling kids are up to. So I was hoping you could take a moment to share what your girls are interested in right now and how they're pursuing it. Yeah, um, their their interests change all the time, and um, I'm not very good at seeing outside of what's right now. But they they've always both loved animals, and they're really keen to get pets at the moment, which we're kind of working on. We live in a a rented townhouse and we're here on a temporary visa um, and we like to travel so I'm not quite sure how that's going to work maybe something that dies quickly but that seems a bit mean um, but we go to the pet shop a lot and we stroke all the dogs and our neighbours have puppies so we, we try to maximise their exposure to animals as much as we can um, which is lovely um, and they if you see us at any point, you'll know because they'll come sh- running up to you and say, can I stroke your dog, please? Which mm. Americans just think is the cutest thing. And it's <laughs> pretty ducky. Um, um, so, yeah, Evie loves being on her iPad. That's when we're at home. Generally, that's what she'll start doing. And she might move away from it, but that's where she'll spend most of her time. She's got some favorite YouTubers that she follows. Um, she plays lots of games the staples are um, goat simulator which is hilarious and and minecraft um but she likes new ones and often she'll get new apps and play them get really great at them play them avidly and then delete them and move on to the next one um clara is a bit of an inventor she likes to she sort of wanders around the house finding things and she makes up little scenarios or she mixes potions or she'll just chat to you about what the other all the ideas she has when I'm a grown up I'm going to do this um, and she likes to tell stories and um, and sometimes Evie will hear those things and she'll come and join in because Clara has some good ideas that she wants in on um, they both like making friends but um, Clara's need for people runs out much quicker than Evie's I think Evie would stay with people all day she never wants to leave whereas Clara has you know her cup fills pretty quickly and she's ready to be by herself or just with the family again um we all love parks we go out quite a lot to see new places um although they're getting a bit i keep pointing out these mountains and these beautiful sites and this wonderful new place and i think they're a bit like oh yeah we've seen it it's just like all the other mountains (laughs) and i'm still (laughs) giddy with excitement but yeah (laughs) it's nice i love i love your point about um animals you know because um there's so many other ways you know when you can't make a a decision or a a choice in the moment or you know it's something that needs to be considered more um there's always other ways to meet that need in the meantime right it's it's so often our answers don't need to be a yes no there mm-hmm. are so many other ways. Like I know even even with Lissy, I would visit her in New York before her puppy, um, before we brought her puppy. She's been there like four years now. So last fall, she finally had a place and roommates who were happy with having a, a dog, a little dog. Mm-hmm. But uh, up until that point, she was constantly going to the pet stores and yeah. stroking the dog. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> 
<laughs> and it's so nice and they can get their fill like we can do those things as much as possible we spent about an hour and a half in a pet yeah. store the other day and the, the people kept coming up and saying can we help you with things and mm-hmm. and i was sort of trying to say well maybe not but we're just you know just poking at these guys and there was a particular bird called mango that clara fell in love with and she was just chatting with them for so long it was really nice yeah, I think that when they were younger, too, and we used to um, go to pet stores in particular, but various places, um, even toy stores, I found mm-hmm. the the best thing for me was um, that expectation piece that you mentioned is, is not having expectations and letting them um, stay as long as they were interested in, you know, because, mm-hmm. man, they can... <laughs> They can stay engaged for a long time in those places, yeah. can't they? Yeah, right? they can. Yeah, yeah. but it's yeah. So worth and it's it. it's difficult sometimes when you're like, okay, let's yeah. move to the next thing, and they're still really engaged. And I have to I have to stop myself and stand back and let them let them be. Yeah. Well, I mean, that was yeah. the same for me before when we uh, we were in New York. Um, Lissy and her boyfriend, they were down there sitting, playing with all the puppies. I I got three of those at home. I'm okay. (laughs) But I wasn't going to go like, hey, guys, come on, come on. Because, you know, it was what I did was I did a little bit of shifting and breathing. And I concentrated on enjoying their joy, like watching them playing and and seeing what was attracting them, which which puppies they were drawn to etc there's almost always something around that I can find to catch my attention if I start to get bored yeah yeah that's a really nice way yeah of doing it mm-hmm. uh, you wrote a post a few months ago uh that was all about how we don't need to rush reading I was hoping you could share a bit about your journey through that conventional push for kids to read earlier and earlier yeah, I think that was me. I mean, intellectually, I was a teacher and I knew that it, it wasn't good to get three and four year olds sitting in the classroom and getting them to copy down things. But when it's your own children, I really felt that it was important that they that they got it early, everything, not just reading. Um, I think I've been achievement for me was always something really important and it was something that you got a prize for or a certificate and that was success is that you got this thing and you had it and you were told well done for it um and actually I think if the girls had have been more compliant we may well have carried on just being really structured and pushy um luckily they they did not and they wanted to do things their own way so I was the like we were saying before I was the one who had to change um and the reading was part of that. Like they, they're into a lot of reading related things. And we used to read books every day. We don't always now. Um, we do it whenever they need to. But there are other reading activities around. Um, and as they get older, I thought that I'd be more worried about it. But um, I'm not. As is reading and in other things, the, the more time goes on, the better I feel about it. I can see their language prog- progressing and their storytelling and they can read pictures and decipher meaning and they make inferences. Um, and they ask me to read things if they need it for whatever it is that they're doing or they figure out what it says by the context. Um, and all these wonderful, brilliant skills that are part of literacy and the rest of it will come whenever, whenever. Um, and it helps as well when I don't compare to other kids, which I used to do a lot. We were around the, the toddler groups and and I used to say, oh, they, they can do this and they can do this, but we can't do that. But we can do this other thing. And, and now that they're not part of the system, it's easier not to do that. And that makes me feel better um, about it all. But I think always with, re- with reading, it's, it just seems to be that unless you have a particular desire to want to do it from early on, it's not helpful to try and make it happen. You just, it it doesn't help anybody and it can be destructive in a lot of ways. Yeah. I think that destructive piece, it can really get in the way. And I, I remember something that was really eye opening for me as my kids were reading later, um, was the realization, you know, because you think reading is so important and, and you know, they, they need to be able to read to do just about anything, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. And, and yet I would, uh, what I started to see when I was paying attention was that it, 
that lack of reading was not actually impacting them. You know, I mean, I would I would read and help out as as needed, but it was so much less needed than I thought it would be. Yeah. I didn't have to trail along behind them 24 hours a day reading yeah, everything that they came into. the words. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. There's so yeah. many other ways to interact with the world. That was such an eye-opening piece for me that there were all these other skills that they were developing that helped them get along in the world. And it was because, you know, in the classroom, in the school, reading is a super important skill, something that they need all the time, right? Yeah. For yeah. for reading textbooks, worksheets, writing down, you know, their doing their worksheets, writing tests and everything. But yeah. outside of that environment, it was um, not as important a skill. And they had the room to develop so many other different skills too, don't they? Mm-hmm. Definitely, yeah. I think it is. it does become necessary in schools because everything is based on what you've done previously Mm -hmm. and it goes up in that kind of structured layered way and if you haven't grasped the reading bit then you can't go on to the next bit but so many kids I would get in secondary I was a high school teacher would come and they would be able to read the words but they wouldn't be able to read for meaning at all and that that surely is the thing that we're aiming for there's no point being able to read words if you can't then figure out you know what it means or try and try and gather something interesting from it or even useful or necessary um but because they've been through this path and it was difficult for them that they had to concentrate so hard on knowing that these letters make up this word that they did their brains didn't have the opportunity to do anything with that other than spell out and sound out the word and this was when they were 11 and 12 and and at that point in the school system it was it was really hard for them to continue to keep up um, without a lot of additional support, which we, you know, obviously try to give, but it tends to make people get further and further behind this arbitrary um, place that people ought to be at. That's such a great point because that lack of reading does impact them in every single subject, right? Because mm-hmm. that is the communication tool yeah. for every subject, whereas you know, outside of the classroom, you know, geography can be playing with playing with the globe and the atlas and conversations and watching videos and and the reading doesn't have to affect um, yeah, so all many of the subjects. other learning that yeah. you do. Yeah, mm. that's so interesting. Um, with unschooling, we're choosing to relate to our children, not through that power and control that we were talking about earlier, but through connection and agreement, you know, finding a path forward that works for everyone involved. And it's such a very different way of interacting with our children. I was hoping you could share a story or two about ways that you guys have worked through times when the girls were wanting to do different things. This is really something I feel like we're working on all the time and it's it's not always successful. Um, it's, I think it's only recently that I've been thinking about this this connection and I think it's, you know, it's fundamental to the unschooling thing, but it takes me a while to catch up sometimes. Um, but that's the bit that we're really trying to focus on. And when they both want the same thing, it's fine. We're, we're all right. But when their needs diverge, it can be, it can be really difficult. Um, so we've found that if all four of us are around Chris is at work during the week but um he comes home in the evening obviously and we have the weekends and it's really useful because there's an adult to a child and we have enough time and space with each of them uh, we went for a walk the other week in the woods and Clara just wanted to run through the whole loop and just play on the other side so she did the whole thing in about a minute and a half and just was happy picking flowers and looking at things and stroking dogs on the other side Whereas Evie wanted to read, they had like a little series of storyboards with a mouse and she wanted to stop and look at all of those and she wanted to climb the trees and tootle off the path and there was a longer trail she wanted to go up there. Um, And having an adult each meant that they could do their own thing safely and not have to be sort of, oh, quick, let's follow your sister or stay back so we can wait for you. And that was really useful. Often it's just the three of us. So... um, that makes it more difficult. We were at an unschooling conference at the weekend, which is lovely. Um, And Evie really wanted to socialize a lot. She wanted to be with people all the time. Clara wanted to look at the raffle area, which was very exciting. Um, We did find a balance. I think they both got enough of their own thing, but um, 
it's it's hard when there's a big space and I can't see them both and they both want to be in different places. Um, we, we do try just to get as much time as possible doing the thing that they want to do and trying to negotiate with the other. And actually it works much better if they do the negotiating rather than I impose it. And they're pretty good at it. They listen to each other probably more than me. Um, and often one of them will be happy to go along with the other one as long as they've had enough to eat and they're not too tired. Um, things are pretty smooth. If one of those things is out of balance, it's, it's a bit more difficult, but we're working on it. I feel like it's, it's a work in progress for us. Uh, and I think that's something that we're always working on because you know what, we, we grow and change and, 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 and our ability to, uh, understand other people's perspective changes. I, I loved there, Emma Marie Ford and I, uh, I'm trying to remember what book it was now from one of our book <laughs> chats, but it was, it was the attachment parenting book. And, and it was talking about how, you know, our actions as parents you know, work out the first time, maybe 50% of the time, but it's the going back and reconnecting and keep keeping looking for that connection and finding Mm -hmm. that way forward. That's where, um, the trust in the relationship, because, you know, if everything's always perfect and working out, you know, there's, there is, uh, less need to, to trust, um, that the other person will, hmm, how should I say that, that, that the people in the conversation will do their best to help you get what you're looking for, even if it can't be immediately. And the other piece, yeah. 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 And the other piece is like you mentioned, have, having them, them work it out. Cause sometimes what we think is fair, right. Um, yeah. isn't they, they work out something completely different, but both of them are happy with that. And yeah. it's, it's always so fun to step back and watch, isn't it? It is. And actually, I can I sometimes think, well, I've got to be equal and fair and I'll assign the same amount of want for their thing Mm -hmm. and think, well, Evie, you know, needs this much stuff and you need this much stuff, Clara. But actually, Evie kind of wants to go and chat to her friends, but she'd be happy to do that for a little bit. And then she'd be happy to come and, you know, whatever it is, the it might not be equal. It might be that 10 minutes of one thing and an hour of another would suit them and they can work that out themselves. Or, you know, if as long as you let me do my thing first, then I'm happy to do your thing for as long as you want afterwards. And they, they come to these conclusions and, um, rather than me saying, well, let's have 30 minutes of this and then 30 minutes of that, because it might not be what they end up needing or wanting. And, it's just it's just constrained, isn't it? Yeah, that was one of the huge realizations for me too. That fair didn't mean equal, mm-hmm. right? It didn't have to be equal amounts of anything. What it what it was was just being fair was meeting their needs. Like you yeah, said, yeah. maybe it was ten minutes of this and an hour of this, and then they were both equally happy, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, nobody felt like they'd missed anything. Everybody felt like they'd been listened to and, yeah, better all around. Yeah. But, mm. yes, it's, it's, uh, I think that that's just part, I think it's part of being human and growing and learning and, and, um, empathy and, and, oh, the, another big piece is, is, is understanding yourself well enough to know, to know that, yeah, this is what they're they're learning, figuring out, as they say, you know, 10 minutes of this, I think will make me happy. And then we can go do your thing. And maybe after that 10 minutes, no, I really wanted more. So, you know, next time maybe mm-hmm. she realizes she wants 15 or 20 or whatever. Yeah. But that's I'll by, a bit more, yeah. <laughs> yeah, by making a choice and seeing how it plays out. That's how we figure ourselves out, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. That's so interesting. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, Your husband, Chris, has recently started writing on your blog as well. Can you share a bit about his journey to unschooling? Yeah, um, I think we sort of came to it together. Um, I think in some ways, de-schooling has been more natural for him. He wasn't as invested in the system as I was. Um, He works in tech and they deal with things all the time that can't be learned in school. They just didn't exist five or 10 years ago. Mm-hmm. Um, so he can really see the benefits of working creatively without the artificial structure of a curriculum. 
Um, and he works with lots of people who are really, really clever and lots of people who don't necessarily have the conventional academic background. Um, and all of them are doing things that just didn't, you know, that not that nobody knew how to do, but that, that, that weren't, they, they weren't a thing. So, mm-hmm. um, I think that's is quite a dynamic, exciting place to work for him, um, but it helps him to 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 see how learning can and should work outside for for children as well as adults. Um, I think, think we do both struggle to have the emotional energy sometimes to keep up with our girls. They're they're spirited. Um, I think that would be the same if they went to school, though. Probably worse because there's lots of school expectations. Um, we do tend to take stock every now and again, which generally means I moan at him and worry about something child related. And he reassures me that it's all going to be all right. Um, and it's really nice. He's very objective and gives me a bit perspective when I can feel a bit close to everything. Um, but I, I feel really lucky because I, I, lots of people I know don't have an equal agreement on home education at all let alone unschooling which can be a scary thing I think to approach for for some people whereas Chris has been on board and kind of an instigator in a lot of it right from the beginning which has made it much easier to um to work towards and to read about and to instigate and um yeah yeah, it's great yeah that is nice (laughs) (laughs) It, it it does help to have, you know, someone you can bounce ideas around to mm. and get feedback from. That's that's wonderful. Thanks, Chris. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, over the years, I've come to think that one of the biggest differences between unschooling and the conventional lifestyle is the amount of free time that our kids have to do whatever they choose, you know, in... You can really see um, our in our goal-driven society that we've lost sight of how incredibly valuable that free time is. And you wrote about this recently as well. So I was hoping you could share some of the benefits that you're seeing uh, that come from releasing expectations around how we spend our time. Um, when they were little, really little, and I was kind of in charge of how we spent our time, I found it a bit of a struggle, like going from being a, a person with no children to having a baby who needs me all the time. Um, and I found time was pretty slow and it was difficult as they got a little, or so Evie got a bit older and then Clara came along to find that balance of being in or out and making sure I was presenting enough stimulation and entertainment and socializing which is silly when they're eight months old but all these things that you feel like you have to give to your baby um whereas now I suggest things and sometimes I'll organize things that they agree to but most of the time it's it's their choice and actually even if we do plan a thing and go to it they can approach it in whichever way suits them they don't have to take part or they don't have to um So say we go to a museum, for example, we don't have to diligently go around each of the exhibits and take notes or, you know, make observations. We can just wander and look or play in the the little playground bit or, you know, whatever, whatever suits them. And they're great at finding things to entertain themselves. um, And they they're pretty good at listening to their own needs, like we were saying before, and and understanding what they what they want and need. I do always find that things are better when we have time. If we if we've got loads of plans and we've got to rush from one thing to another, um, it makes it more difficult because I think that transition, um, well known for being a difficult thing for toddlers, is really hard for me also. Um, that you know, get your shoes on and let's get out the door, and we've got to be there on time, and that generally leads to a bit of fraught energy from all of us. Um, so after a bunch of that, which we try, I tried to avoid, but if it does happen, we generally need to have at least a day at home doing very little, just chatting and playing or watching. Um, and then they rest and we process all the stuff that we've seen and things we've done. And actually the following days after that, I'll usually see them bringing up some of the things that have happened. They're, um, they're be playing and you'll hear some of the things that they've learned or they'll discuss new ideas or they'll start using new words or concepts um but 
but if we're busy, 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 it's really difficult for them to to process anything. So it's just going from one thing to the next, um, and it's fun and we have a lovely time. But we actually we do need that that downtime regularly, like at least once or twice a week, or sometimes whole weeks. We will not do very much at all just to balance out the um, the uh, I don't know what I'm trying to say the the all the things we've done basically all the stuff that's been happening yeah um, I, sorry, think, I think I think you're when you were talking about the processing I think that is that seems to be the key piece that is missing or maybe has been forgotten you know with our 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 drive to you know have goals and to meet them and to do 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 Mm -hmm. being prized and and not doing seems to be lazy you know is judged as uh as lazy it's it's like we've forgotten that we need all that processing time to just to put together what we've experienced Mm. Does that make sense? I yeah, mean, yeah, 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 it really that, does. Yeah. yeah. And actually, so what, I, I forget it all the time. And often on the right? blog, I, I know. things <laughs> as, a, as a reminder to me of this is what it means and this is what you have to remember yourself. And this is definitely one of those that I'm, I want to do all the things and I can see all these amazing opportunities and things going on and I, I want to do all of them. And I have to remember that that's not what they need or, you know, it's not what they need all, all the time. And this slowness and this this thing that some people <laughs> I look on Instagram and some people just have it so together and their lives are so beautiful and they have these lovely slow days of playing and I think oh, we need to do that more. I need to remember to do that more. Um, but that's the, the, the problem with social media, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> those, those little snapshots. Yeah. Uh, there, there's a book out recently called Rest that uh, mm-hmm. I have, uh, I've, I've seen it and actually I downloaded the preview piece and I will probably pick it up. But I mean, that's the focus reminding us again that that this time is valuable. It's not wasted. Mm-hmm. Um, and my kids, as they got older, taught me that too. Like as, as you're, not, well, older because my kids were older when they left school, right? Because I, it was a while mm-hmm. before I found it. But um you know, they were always out on the swing or going for a long walk or just listening to music. And instead of um, having expectations and judging that time as down um, or wasted, just purposefully saying, hmm, you know, they're just relaxing and and, yeah and you notice after right like you said they're mentioning things that in their play that they've come come across it from activities that they had um, finished it the insights that come after are just always so amazing and that's that is um, one of the big pieces that helped because I was very you know uh, invested in the system as you described it and mm-hmm. and goal driven and everything and uh i came to see so i learned so much just from this whole process about how human beings work really and and i had such a respect for um them taking that time even though it's supposedly frowned upon but it was it was so valuable to them and it was so interesting to to learn that and see that and then see um still seeing the push so much from you know once they became teenagers and their friends and and their friends families you know you got to go do this do this do this there was so little time for that that it was it was a big difference for me you know between the two different lifestyles that I saw so I I always thought that was interesting it is. And actually it's, it's helped me to do the same because I, mm. when I was working before I felt I was really driven and I wanted to do well in my chosen career. And there were several of them and I wanted to do well in all of them. And I felt like I had to have things planned. Um, mm-hmm. and if I didn't have plans, I felt like I was being lazy. Like you say, I felt like I wasn't achieving anything and then I'd feel guilty and then it would spiral into it, you know, just generally, but, um, 
And now I think, you know, it's fine to just sit and knit for a while or just, you know, not have anything planned. Just sit and watch the children play and or sit on the beach and look at the waves or, you know, these cliched things. But actually they're they're valuable and, and it's okay to do that. And I don't have to be doing anything. It's all right to be lazy and it's not lazy <laughs> I was gonna say we still call it that right I, I mean I still have that same same thing as well you know you can realize that those quiet moments are where there's room for insight to happen for that processing to happen for creative connections mm. um, between things you know you you realize oh my your subconscious is working on things but it's still so easy to get caught up in well I need but I need to do this and this and this and this and that's the first thing that drops off right (laughs) yeah yeah and we should prioritize it definitely yeah it's so interesting uh your girls are still young but I must suspect that you've already experienced this so sometimes it seems that just as we think we've found a groove with our children things change, you know, we're connecting well, we're finding great ways to support them and their interests. And, you know, we're getting to the park, we're, you know, figuring out ways that they can both get what they they need and things are happy. And then poof, all of a sudden, it feels like we're playing catch up again, trying to figure it all out. Uh, Things just aren't working out as smoothly as they were before. So I was wondering if you've come across that situation and how you have moved through it daily yeah all the time (laughs) (laughs) it's funny I don't worry at all about the learning part of unschooling it's there all the time and um, I can see the great steps they're taking and we have loads of social opportunities which is great but this bit this I was saying before this connection bit and this change and catching up with them I feel like I constantly have to reevaluate um especially with Evie. I think Clara and I are quite similar in a lot of ways and I find it a bit more easy to read her and she will seek me out. Whereas um, Evie doesn't really like hugs, which are my first choice of connection always. Mm -hmm. Um, And she'll go back and forth between wanting long stretches of her own space. Like, thank you, mommy. I'm ready for you to go now. Um, And then constant companionship. She wants you to be by her side chatting to her and doing with her. Um, And it's trying to find the ways that I can that I can connect with her especially um, because she does need it and the times when when she takes her own time is great but then she'll come back and if I if I'm not ready to give her full-on commitment and um, attention she she struggles with that and um, um, it it can reflect in the in the way that she feels and the way that she behaves and and things are difficult for her and then they're difficult for me and then it becomes a big cycle of you know of stuff um we're good at the moment actually and sometimes I feel sure that I've I've finally cracked it and I've got all these parenting answers and I know my children so well and isn't this just wonderful and then obviously it lasts about 10 minutes and (laughs) then need change and I'm catching up again but I do feel really glad that we have this like unschooling ethos framework. I don't know what, what to call it, but it really helps to just focus on the relationship. And that's the thing, whatever, you know, whatever else is happening. And if, if we're, if there's behaviors that are difficult for me or from them, it's all about just finding that connection and, and making sure that I give my, give them enough time and things, emotional things that they need um, so yeah, that, that's also a working. And I think, I don't think that I'll ever stop because they, they just change all the time, don't they? Mm-hmm. And the ways that, that they need me will change. And I just need to be there waiting and finding ways of doing that. I know that that's one of the pieces too. Cause you know, when you're, uh, and sometimes you're really enjoying that spot, you know, for that day or two. Yeah. <laughs> this is one that you you want to hold on to. It. Yeah. <laughs> but no hugs, really, really. Yeah. <laughs> no, I know she will. Sometimes she prefers them from Chris than me, obviously. Um, but she will sometimes, and I, those I really treasure those moments. Most of the time, she's not interested in hugs. <sighs> <laughs> I know that was the piece. It was the um being okay with the unknown maybe is a way to put it because it's like, okay, we're not, you know, doing that anymore. 
Um, and, and then there's that time where, where you're feeling out what is the new way you're going to yeah. connect. And it's developing that trust that that way is going to show up. But that unknown middle is always is always hard. Um, but the, the more that you go through the process, the more you trust that, I know we're going to find something. We're going to find yeah, something. Just give it know. a bit of time. Yeah. Yeah. And this that is was part great... of that. My inability to, to see outside of now is that I, yeah. I do forget that. I do forget that it's, it will be all right. And, it, you know, give it a little bit of time and I'll keep finding these ways. And then in a few days or hours or minutes, it's going to be okay again. Um, Mm-hmm. That's where, yeah, where Chris can help to to assuage me a bit. <laughs> <laughs> the other point that you made that was great is is how our kids can be different too, right? Mm-hmm. And um, I know uh, my elder two were much more um, conversational. Um, they were more they would more um, talk as as they're processing. Right. Yeah. So I kind of I knew what was going on. I knew what they were thinking about. I knew where they were contemplating. Um, and whereas my youngest was was not a talker. It's interesting for me looking back that he is the the physical movement person. Right. He mm-hmm. got into karate and black belt and, and you know, he's now a martial artist. Um, so he was much more of a movement person. So his processing, a lot of it was internal, right? Yeah. So I would, it, I would have to look for different ways to connect with him, right? Mm. But it took a while to figure that out, yeah. right? I'm like, but yeah. no, talk to me, talk to me. <laughs> <laughs> I need to talk. You must need to talk too. Exactly. <laughs> and he'd look at me like I had two heads. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah. No, let's do mm-hmm. this. I'm like, okay. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, no, it's 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 really fascinating. But like you said, it's it's that um that time and that learning um to pull it's you know what? I think we find our clues as to like you said, remembering to um pull up to the bigger picture rather than being mm-hmm. stuck in the moment. And yeah. then sometimes when you're up in the bigger picture and your head's, your mind's, you know, turning and turning and turning and, and it's hard to get into the moment itself. Like, yeah, yeah. And it's just finding um, what are the little clues for ourselves as that that tell you, oh, I think I'm stuck in this place or stuck in this place. And all that comes with with time and experience. But. Yeah, it's hard. When Maybe you're by the, the time they're twenty five, I'll be, you know, I'll be wise. <laughs> and then things change Probably again. Not, yeah. <laughs> oh, that's so fun! Well, thank you so much for taking the time to speak with me today, Joe. I had a great time. Mm-hmm. Me too. <laughs> uh, before we go, uh, where's the best place for people to connect with you online? Um, I have a Facebook page, Girls Unschooled, that links to the blog and you can message me if you like. Um, and I post pictures of our days on Instagram at girls underscore unschooled. I love Instagram. Loads of lovely people there. Um, so, yeah, be nice oh, to hear from you. <laughs> that is great. And I will add links to all those places in the show notes as well. Thank you very much and have a great day. Thank you so much, Pam. Bye. Bye. Thanks for listening. I hope you found it helpful. You might also like the backlist episodes at livingjoyfully.ca forward slash podcast. While you're there, be sure to check out the third book in my Living Joyfully with Unschooling series, Life Through the Lens of Unschooling. This book is a wide array of essays drawn from my blog that shed light on the day-to-day lives of unschooling families. You'll find essays tackling everything from learning to read to visiting relatives, all organized around nine keywords that have been woven into the fabric of our unschooling lives. De-schooling, learning, days, parenting, relationships, family, lifestyle, unconventional, and perspective. The theme is life, the lens, unschooling. Until next time, have fun living and learning with your family.